we are live and recorded on Thursday Night Live tonight because, as you can see by some of the evidence in the area, I am a mom and tonight I have a meeting at my daughter's school. So Thursday Night Live is very beautifully, um, the Parsha is Kaya Sara, who is our matriarch, the progenitor, feminine, goddess image of Jewish womanhood, and I have to pre-record because I need to go out and be a Jewish woman tonight. Uh, tonight's theme is Chesed Shel Emet, and so much of it is inspired by this idea of what is it to become something that we all possess, male, female, non-gendered, non-binary, however we might identify. We all possess within us a quality of loving kindness that is not only radiated or, or shared with another, but is never expected back. And that is what Sara Imanu represents uh, to me this evening as we explore her final days. To go into Thursday Night Live, a part of what we do is we establish a sacred covenant, a Brit Shalom, a, a Brit of peace for us to kind of apprehend our kavanot, like what are we doing, what are our intentions, and how are we to hear and receive. Our ability to hear and receive always comes from having a mascaret, a framework. So our framework begins with number one, the shior comes from a place of love. And that's actually one of our themes tonight, is love. So it comes from a place of love, and because of that we must open our hearts to transformation because if we're here and we're stolid and we're set in our ways then spiritual transformation doesn't happen so my bracha my blessing for all of us is that we're kind of letting it wash through us and whatever kind of mikvah of of being whatever cleansing of epiphany might run through us may it happen can you hear that zone then I recommend getting a journal or something legal pad, something to write with, so that if any thoughts come up and we don't want to lose it, to write it to capture it. And then when judgments arrive, arise, which is going to happen because we're all judgy judge of ourselves, to make it a practice, because it's really good to kind of consider it this way, to make it a practice that we kind of observe them and we, we allow them to move them through us. The other way to look at it that I was thinking about this week is when judgments arise, ask ourselves, what do we want to do with them, right? What do I want to do with this judgment? Because that also gives us agency and allows us to understand that the judgment doesn't have to be the pre-moving force of our reactions, but the thought of, of how am I dealing with that judgment becomes um, kind of a godhead or a wisdom that we might have on top of us. Okay, uh, next, uh, there are many ways to do Jewish. There are many ways to do Jewish. I'm not saying that this is the derech, I'm just saying that it's a derech, it's one path of doing Jewish. So if something resonates with you tonight, that's great, I'm just a chick who loves Torah, and please put in the notes section if something that you wanna share that inspires you and that can allow a dialogue to occur. And with that comes the idea that uh, denominationalism is a 19th century Jewish innovation. We're all just Jews. And so allow ourselves to experience different thoughts and ideas as one of the ways for us to hold on to Klal Yisrael. Like if we can have um, a, a, me a medley of voices, then we can begin to experience the choir that is this incredibly ancient voice of millions of voices before us singing to us today and that's what Torah study is about that's what it's supposed to bring unto us is the is the heavenly choir of truth singing forth and that's what we're going for today so where are we in our journey remember um, we are still in the month of Cheshvan doesn't it go on forever Mar Heshvan, Mar. It really, it's a never ending month. And in this month, we have this Akara, we have this barrenness, the barrenness of space and time. We have Shabbat to step into for our, our only Chag each month, is the month of Heshvan, is we only have the celebration of Shabbat. Otherwise, we're really left with the silence of ourselves after the rigor and intensity of Tishrei. And as we're at about the 23rd or 24th of Cheshvan today, um, like what is it that we wanted to penetrate that we began last month? These are, this is really, we're entering our last week of this month before we get to Kislev and the light is to increase. And so we literally today in Chaya Sara are going to go into the cave and we need to go deep into this place of shadow 
and in order to understand where the origins of light are and the way that the light is supposed to inform us. So that's where we are in our journey. Before we step into Torah, we always begin with the ritual of the blessing of Torah. And so let's take a little moment to bring ourselves to this bracha and think about the business of Torah. It's Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kidshanu B'mitzvatav Tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. Boom! Let's slam it down. Let's do some Torah. So in the past week, whew, in the past week, wow, we were through a lot. We were in Ve'era. Ve'era, like that's intense. It's it's the majority of the tests of Avraham Avinu. He has transformed into the self of of being uh, Avraham. Where I like to say his his name is actually an anagram for Barahem, right? He really gets the name Barahem, Avraham, create them. He becomes our official progenitor. He gets the seal of approval of God, of the Brit Milah, and he was convalescing at his tent, and he was visited, and then he had all of his trials and his tests, and it ends with the grand climax of the Akedah, of the binding of Isaac, which we have to ask ourselves, did he pass or did he fail? Like, was Avraham Avinu meant to inflict the trauma to Yitzhak? to go up on Mount Moriah and to actually create a pyre for an offering of his child. It seems, if it's, if it's truly the 10th test, then our, our God truly, the God character has a sense of humor that is perhaps um, quite a curious one. Uh, but what we do have to say this week in Hayasara is, is that Agadah, that story, is, is really primary because the rabbis relate to it again and again and again in the commentary of this week as to what happens in the beginning. Remember, Avraham Avinu had to deal with his pain point. And in order to deal with his pain point of being asked the audacious task from God to take what is supposed to be the manifestation of the promise of Israel and sacrifice it because of Amuna, because of faith. I mean, if that's not an acute pain point. I don't know what it is. So with that endurance test, we come to today, Chaya Sara, and some of the rabbis say that she dealt with her pain point by dying, but let's go into the text and take a look at what happened. So it talks about um, the life of Sara, right? It talks about um, Sarah's life and how she um, began here. Let me just go into the text here because I have it right here. How she started her, her this Torah portion began um, and it begins as we all famously know, um, it's called the life of Sarah, but it, it actually goes right into the death of Sarah. So our Parsha begins um, in this heartbreaking, heartbreaking, heartbreaking Pasuk. And the Pasuk simply, so simply states, I mean, it, it's so simple, and yet it's so profound in the enumeration of, um, of what happens. Because it really is, it's, it's like, um, it's simplicity. It sounds like this. The Yehiyu Chaye Sarah, and these were the days of Sarah. Mea Shana, the Esrim Shana, like the English, Sarah's lifetime, the span of Sarah's life came to 127 years. That's what happens to all of us. We don't know the extent of the time of what it's going to be. But at some point in this experience, those who are left behind will turn and say, you know, Lori's life, it was this many years and this many years and this many years. And that was her life. And each and every one of us will have this simple sentence put upon us of what our lives were. And when we think about that, you know, it's really kind of, um, it's an amazement. But it, it's, it's also like a refreshing reality that we're asked to enter into. Chaya Sara is the gift at the end of Cheshvan of saying, okay, you know, we're deep in the darkness. We're dwelling most deeply in the darkness. 
and we need to deal with the finality of life. We need to deal with this evanescent, fleeting experience that we have here and how it's supposed to transform us for eternity. And that's how Chaya Sara begins. Then it tells us, the Tamot Sara, the Kiryat Arba, he Hevron. So she died, Sarah, in Kiryat Arba, which are, are these um, four cities, and it's now Hebron. Be'eretz Kanan, ve'yavo Avraham, lispod la Sara, uliv kota. Which is like, whew, heartbreaking. It says she died in Kiryat Arba, now Hebron, one of the four holy cities of Israel, in the land of Canaan, preceding the time of Israel. And then it says, and Abraham proceeded lispod. It says to mourn, but lispod, remember, it's the same shorish as hesped. So it's to eulogize. He goes to eulogize this beloved, beloved, whether she was his sister or whether she was his half-sister or whether she was perhaps his niece. The rabbis have lots of commentaries of who Sarah was. We do know most essentially she was his partner, she was his wife, and she was the mother of his destined child. And he comes to Hebron and he eulogizes her and in it he weeps. Now there's a commentary that, you know, there's a, a smaller cough to suggest to us that he had a public and a private life and that publicly Avraham, um, he eulogized her and spoke beautifully of her life and elevated her for others, which is such a gorgeous idea of mourning for those of us that have the capacity to allow ourselves to transform mourning into dancing or poetry or inspiration for others. What a gorgeous gift in the wake of mourning. And then the rabbis comment that the tiny cough is because he, he wept privately and he didn't want to, um, he didn't want to, to overstep his emotions into another person's receiving. And so there was a humility, a beautiful public private idea of a man, a human, you know, the idea of humans of letters, men of letters, women of letters, of that great uh, 18th century tradition of someone who lived for the public to kind of elevate the public and exemplify in their, in their walking through life being um, with a tenderness and a vulnerability, but the gravity of the sorrow to hold it privately. It's a very anti uh, 21st century uh, internet obsessed, influencer obsessed culture. And so I just wanna kind of honor that gorgeous, humble, tiny cough and how much it reminds us of. Avraham and Sarah, in, in the modeling of, of this moment of loss, of this moment of, of how they moved together as a couple, you know, um, they really kind of have a standard of relationship that goes beyond, I think, the way that we think of Ozer or Ozeret, of of the partner in life that will complete us. I, I really think that there's something about the life of Sarah and something the, about the way her death is handled by Avraham that, that reminds us of the greatest of what we, we can bring forward through the experience. And the rabbis, just building on that idea, they, they talk about, and I'm just going to read this, that they, they say it's... Um, the life of Sarah in the commentary. It's not the usual way to record the deaths of women, even righteous ones, unless it's by mean of a deed. Um, but for, for behold, we find only Sarah, Rachel, and Devorah, Devorah being Rivka's wet nurse, not Devorah of the Book of Judges, and Miriam um, are, are the four noted female deaths in the entire Torah, which is kind of startling. They say Sarah's deaths is, is mentioned since she makes known to us how the grave was acquired with riches, so they're going to now allude forward to the cave of Mahpelah. Um, Devorah's death is mentioned because it makes us know the name of the place alone, Bahut, so that's just a commentary. And Rachel's death is mentioned because it teaches us that she was not buried in Marat Mahpelah, which is an in another interesting reminder. She's actually buried um, in uh, Bethlehem on the road to Hebron. And why is it that their years are not numbered, except for Sarah? Well, the rabbis want us to know Dafka, Sarah's death was the most important of them all. 
and uh, again, Chaya Sara as a Chesed Shalemet, that's what we're exploring tonight, and why is Sarah's life the most important of them all? I kind of front-loaded this idea of their relationship with one another, of Abraham and Sarah, and we're going to look at this duality, and what is this partnership, and what was the, the, the intensity of it, uh, such a public partnership with one another, such a public partnership. So what was it that made their relationship just so exemplary? It says, Sarah died in Kiran Arba, now Hebron, in the land of Canaan, and Abraham proceeded to mourn for Sarah and bewail her. Now, there's an interesting commentary, Rashi, on the Perkei de Rabbi Eliezer. He says to bewail, or, or to mourn Sarah and to weep for her. It says that the narrative of the death of Sarah follows immediately after the binding of Isaac, because through the announcement of the binding, her son had been made ready for sacrifice and had almost been sacrificed. She re received a great shock. And this is the commentary, the famous commentary that says um, the great shock was literally her soul flew from her and she died. That it was such a shock that she died at the news. And that's from Perkei Rabbi Eliezer. And then that's a little bit of Rashi woven in. But first, the first thing we're offered by the rabbis, by the male rabbis, is that she is so shocked by this message that her son was almost sacrificed to Mount Moria that she, she can no longer live. And um, just to kind of take that in of Sarah Manu, who had been through so much, is just, for me, more of an insight into um, who, who the rabbis were than Sarah. Because I truly, this one I, I can't believe. This one I can't swallow. I think what I struggle with with it is that it's, it's so, um, they present her as so fragile after having been through so much, right? and reigned through so much. It reminds me of kind of Patai or some of the other words, works of concepts of the ancient Near Eastern goddess and how um, the goddess was actually subverted by a masculine deity and that they tried to chasten or weaken the presence of the goddess. And what they, what they kind of um, replaced it with was a concept of a masculine virile god. And so, I believe this commentary to be one of those one of those chastened texts showing the weakened goddess. Because really, think of her name, Sar. You know, Sar is like a priestess. Do, do priestesses die with with audacious news? I mean, that's almost like Medea. You know, that sounds more of a of a Greek of a Greek sort of myth than it does um, of one of our of our of our priestesses of Sarah. She was 90 years old and she was pregnant and nursing. Now, someone who did that at half that age, I have to say, I can't believe that she did it double that age. So she really, like, like what chutzpah she had, what strength she had. She endured Pharaoh and Avimelech, you know? She was a match for other priests and kings. She stood her own, you know? She allowed herself to kind of, like, be elastic and change according to Abraham's vision because she trusted her partner and she also had her own delight. You know, how many Midrashim do we need to write about what Sarah was doing with Abimelech? You know, he was this, this, this really, this character, they say, who, who had, who had received a, the, the Nachash, the jacket of the Nachash. This is one of the Zoharic texts, I believe it was, that he received the, 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 the snakeskin right, that had been handed down from Adam, and that, and that Sarah is hanging with this guy. Like, what was going on there? This is a woman of great moral character, wisdom, and intelligence. I do not believe, and I stand by this, that Sarah was chastened and died at the news of Isaac. And from Sarah to Sarai to Sarah, um, you know, the idea of the hay, this is more of a folk etymology, but the idea of the hay, the letter hay, as her transformation to engage in a concept of Hashem is quite profound. And uh, finally, they say that um, as far as being a daughter of Haran and therefore Abraham's brother, um, they say that she was Iska, who is from the, the, the lineage of Shem, which is kind of in and of itself um, an idea of Sarah that has a whole other lineage and destiny to it. So I guess this proof text is just saying this woman was not faint-hearted, and I can't believe that she she died at the news of what might have happened. I'd rather go to Sefer Hayashar, which is a beautiful, beautiful midrash on what happened in the moment of Sarah, and, and please indulge me in reading it to you. It says, according to the other legend, Satan came to Sarah disguised as an old man, and he told her that Isaac had been sacrificed. Believing it to be true, she cried bitterly but soon comforted herself 
With the thought that the sacrifice had been offered at the command of God, she was resilient. She started from Beersheba to Hebron, asking everyone she met if they knew in what direction Abraham had gone. And then Satan came again in a human shape and told her that it was not true that Isaac had been sacrificed, that he was living and he would soon return to her. Well, Sarah, on hearing this news, became so joyous that this Midrash says she died of joy at Hebron. Avraham and Yitzhak returned to their home at Beersheba and not finding Sarah there, went to Hebron when they discovered her dead. Now, Sefer HaYashar, this one is like, this is rich in commentary for me because the idea is that Sarah, Sarah was just in a place of anticipatory joy, which then doesn't fill in the commentary of what she was doing, but perhaps she was making a meal or perhaps she was fantasizing about seeing her beloved and her son again. And in that moment of pure joy reached the end of her life. Perhaps she was reflecting upon being a mother at 90. Perhaps she was, you know, rejoicing in the incredible journey she and Abraham had been on. Perhaps she laughed again to herself thinking of what he did and what he kind of proved in his amuna and saw it as a fulfillment of what Hashem had promised. And in that laughter and joy, she was done. That's a Sara that I can kind of relate to a little bit more than that kind of like sorrowful one that dies at the, at the, at the, the presence of, of the calamity of what might have happened. But it leads me to like really consider what Sarah was in her death. What are we supposed to learn? Because really this Parsha Chaya Sarah is to remember her life because in her death, it really spotlights in neon letters what her life was. You know, her life really is, is remembered eulogized by Avraham. It's eulogized publicly, cried about privately, and in the eulogy, we learn of pure character. There's a beautiful book that David Brooks wrote. He's a very complex character. And as he was dealing with his own inner complexity as a man, he wrote a book on character and it probably helped him um, come through some difficult time that he was in. He talks about it in his book as well. And in it, um, he really asks uh, us how we measure our lives. How do we measure our character? And he says in our lives so often, we measure our lives through our resumes, right? That we look at our resumes and our accomplishments and that really becomes the metric through which we, we say we, we existed and we accomplished. And then he offers the second idea, which is what if we measure our lives rather in terms of, of the eulogy that someone's going to one day give us? What if we direct our lives and its accomplishments by saying someday someone's going to talk about me at my death and my eulogy is all that's going to endure. It's going to be the last sound waves going out into the universe representing me. And so the choices I make in this life are going to be directed by my thought that someday someone's going to say those things. And I want that final husband to be, to be filled with hallelujah, right? Hallelujah. Like Sarah, she died with joy, so joyous at what she accomplished in her life that she merited the chesped from Avraham. I mean, that makes so much more sense than her dying in this dark way. So it makes me wonder, like, what are we working for in our lives? What value are we putting forward in, in, in the smallest minutia of our tasks? This idea that, um, you know, as that musical Rent, ironically written by a young man who died when it was in previews, gives us the beautiful lyric, 525,600 minutes. That's 525,600 moments to make a, a choice that is going to bring a hallelujah to the hearts and thoughts of everyone when we depart. I'm not saying we should be maudlin about it. This shouldn't be sad. This should be like, wow, you know, every moment is an opportunity to eternalize the chesed that I was naturally given in being alive and transform it to others through memory when I'm gone. And what Brooks does, David Brooks in his book, is he, is he talks, you know, he kind of borrows from Lonely Man of Faith and Rav Salvechek, Adam 1 and Adam 2, right? These two ideas of Adam. 
and Adam Wan is concerned with um, with material material knowledge, material material gain, um, being more um, concerned with uh, matter over form. Um, someone who's really seeking in this life as much as as one could get, whereas Adam II is more existential, and that's what Salvechik goes to talk about in his in his masterful work. Um, I believe it was the, his, his uh, PhD in philosophy that he wrote it. And the idea, it's an existentialist work, is that Adam too is the one, he's the lonely man of faith, he's the one who's truly looking at um, form over matter, who's looking at the more esoteric, numinous presence in our mists and trying to define life through a relationship of these, of these greater ideals. And, and that's, you know, all of us being Adam too is what we're aspiring to be in our lives. It's the idea of like, where did I come from and where am I going? And a part of the analogy that I give is um, Abraham is Adam one. Abraham is, is, is the man of matter. He's the man of material. He's the man of, of synthesis and trial by fire. And his partner, Sarah Imanu, is Adam two. Sarah represents for us the human of form, the human of the ideal, the human of, of, of um, form and also conformity in the greatest of ways of making room for another in a, in a, in a way that's both sensual and priestly and um, audaciously evolved. Like Sara, really, she is the ideal and that's why in her death, we call her Parsha Chaya Sara, the life of Sara, because that is what endures is this incredible presence of her chesed, the incredible presence of, of all that she was and bred humbly alongside another. She's the, she's the lonely ima of faith that, that really held all of us in her 90th year to come through her. You know, we, we, we're not going to hear of her kfetch. We hear of her laughter. Yeah. So what happens in Chaya Sara? Avraham must buy the land in order to create his life's legacy. And where does he learn this from? He learns it from Sarah, right? In order to have the final fulfillment of, of the promise that he made with Hashem, he must buy the cave of Machpelah from Ephron, who's a little kind of wildly character. So Avraham and Sarah together really model chesed. The Sifre says, there's a beautiful, a beautiful insight by the Sifre. Chesed begins with those who are closest to us and then encompass our neighbors and then finally the rest of the world. So chesed is a concept of love that we learn intimately in our family system. Now the cave of Machpelah, that becomes a beautiful um, kind of uh, analogy for us to crawl into and understand like what was being learned in that moment from Abraham, and I'm, I'm playing with this idea, so let's kind of go there. It's Malrat Machpelah, Machpelah also coming from the Hebrew for doubling or double. And this is, this is another proof of Abraham and Sarah representing a doubling of human form. It's the presence of the doubling that this relationship kind of evolves concepts of chesed. And when we do that, we enter into a cave of relationships. And the cave I want to go to is a little bit of Plato's cave, you know, the famous analogy and allegory of the cave. So we, we say that Plato's point, in essence, is that the general terms of our language are not names of physical objects that we can see, they're actually names of things that we can't see, things that we can only grasp with the mind. So basically the allegory of the cave was a bunch of, um, a bunch of prisoners are in a cave and there's fire and there are objects that are passed before the fire, but they can't see the ob objects. They can only see the shadows on the wall. And so what they begin to understand um, uh, form by, like this is a book, they only discover through the concept of its matter, that it's this thing and not this, I they only have the idea of it. They're not getting the essence of it. They're kind of um, attaching to themselves to shadow and not to the actual experience. And the idea of the allegory of the cave is that we're not getting the essence of the experience for us. We're getting the shadow of the experience of life. But when we can penetrate it, that's when life comes like incredibly fiery. And I think that Chaya Sara is Abraham's allegory of the cave. He 
in purchasing the cave, he is transforming himself from a prisoner of the tests, from being in a place of kind of blindness. He's running towards the fulfillment, but he's never fulfilling it. And here he comes broken, kind of trying to elevate the brokenness by beginning to articulate the beauty of his experience with his beloved. And in finding that language of, of his love for Sarah through his chesed and the inner brokenness of his cry, he's able to kind of understand finally what he was meant to do, which is stake his claim to this land that would be his blessing, Eretz Yisrael. And he buys this kever, you know? He buys this grave for his beloved out of his brokenness, but it is truly this tiny, symbolic destiny fulfillment for him. But it only occurred through this, this, this growth that he had that came to finally his ultimate loss. And then in that loss, with the fragility and the subtlety and vulnerability of his being, he could finally fulfill the promise of Hashem. In this idea of the cave, of the, the allegoric space, of, of, of what is shadow and what is light, of what we know and what we don't know, in that space of the cave of Machpelah, Ma'arat Machpelah, Avraham Avinu finally understood chesed, a chesed shel emet, a loving kindness that he could never ever have repaid to him by Sarah. And in that moment of acquiring her kever and fulfilling the mitzvah of burying her there, fulfills the grandest mitzvah of his life, which was to really uh, have this covenantal promise with God. So I guess what it is this week in a chesed shel emet of those tiny things that we give with love that we can never receive back is that when we discover them in our lives, they really fulfill the essence and the purpose of why we're here. I think that's the simplest idea of chesed shel emet. And so I leave us with that. I give a blessing. May we all seek in the 525,600 minutes of this year moments of opportunity of chesed shel emet in the zachut and the merit of Avraham Yivinu and Sarah Imanu. And may we all rise the way Avraham did through the zachut of her memory. May we all rise to hear the call of those moments ourselves.